This last lecture on the eschatology of victory from Adam through the Afrikaner, I would like to deal with the eschatology of victory of the Afrikaner in the years ahead. Now I've said previously that uh, Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 10 is a significant text. In the New American Standard Version of the Bible, this is translated as follows. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshippers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. Many have regarded this as a prediction of the Afrikaner's contribution to the expansion of true Christianity worldwide from South Africa beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Be that as it may, there is no doubt at all that the Afrikaner Calvinist, as indeed many other peoples in the world, has much to offer the world even in today's atomic age. And that's what it is, an atomic age. But then books are appearing in South Africa today with titles underlining this. Uh, an important book published by Calvinists in South Africa recently has the arresting title The Atomic Age in Thy Light. Uh, the best faculties of nuclear research in South Africa uh, have Calvinists uh, as their chairman. Uh, much medical work, especially in the field of heart transplant technology, as is well known, uh, is being pioneered in that land. And so too, processes of enriching uranium at a very, very cheap price uh, are also being pioneered. Professor Donnie Strauss, uh, of course, um, wants to have the Afrikaner take over where the Dutch have left off as the leaders of world Calvinism. Uh, he envisions, envis envisions South Africa becoming the new Geneva and importing and training foreigners in South Africa to go back to their lands as sturdy Calvinists and then to Calvinize their own countries. My own personal dream is rather exactly the opposite. Rather than become a new Geneva, I think South Africa should become like the old Jerusalem. It should send forth the law from Zion to the four corners of the earth, uh, there combining the best of South African Calvinism with the best of the foreign Calvinism it meets or helps create, uh, and then it should be the non-South Africans living in those territories farther afield who themselves uh, take all of this amalgamated for the, in the correct mix for their circumstances and perfected for each individual country as all of us who love the Lord and the doctrines of grace together work toward the Calvinistic conquest of the whole world. In 1967, Rousus John Rush Dooney wrote me in a letter, I believe South Africa although unfortunately now showing signs of drifting, is still more Christian than any other country of today and has a major contribution to make. South African Reformed believers are more aware of the basic issues of our time. Too many American Reformed thinkers are prone to sentimental humanism as they view social issues. This year, 1980, uh, the Presbyterian Church of Australia's Dr. Harold Whitney, a man with three earned doctorates and a warm admirer of both Van Til and Rush Dooney, and a man who has himself written that the whispers of Calvary must not preclude the thunders of Sinai, wrote me a heartwarming personal letter. As retiring chairman of the Department of Systematic Theology at Emmanuel College of Queensland University, he wrote to congratulate me on his General Assembly's appointment of me as his successor. 
And then, significantly, I believe, he added the following words. I am personally looking forward to your coming among us because, among other reasons, of my love for South Africa. Four times I visited this fascinating land on evangelistic work, apart from my visits to Germany, Britain, and the United States several times. I visited South Africa twice in 1968, once in 1969, once in 1970. And, as the enclosed document will show, Dr. Lee, I had the privilege of speaking in many Reformed churches. Well, the enclosed document that uh, Dr. Whitney referred to was an account of his 1970 visit to South Africa. I believe in this last lecture I can do no better than to take a few minutes of my time than to quote from this letter here because I believe it gives an accurate insight by a non-South African, by an impartial outsider into the true condition of Calvinism in South Africa much better than a biased person such as myself could do. Says Dr. Whitney, I learned the value of face-to-face -face confrontation. This is good New Testament practice. Paul knew the value of witnessing before governors. I was able, therefore, to spend a most profitable hour and a half over morning tea with Dr. Vorster, brother to the Prime Minister of South Africa and leader and moderator of the General Assembly of the Reformed Church. It was through Dr. Forster's courtesy that I was able to speak in the Reformed Mother Church in Cape Town. That, by the way, is the oldest church in South Africa. Once again, I was impressed with the bond that is quickly established between men who both believe in the authority of the Word of God. Our discussion covered a wide range of theological subjects and contemporary theologians, as well as missionary and evangelistic outreach. It covered Dr. Wormbrand's visit to South Africa and his fight against communism, to which Dr. Forster, too, is wholeheartedly committed likewise. We also discussed South Africa's potential for revival. Before Dr. Forster drove me home from his residence on Devil's Peak, a rather ambiguous place, I laughingly reminded him, for a minister of Christ to live on, I left him with a copy of my book on John Calvin and the Institutes, with authority to bring out a paperback edition in Afrikaans for his people if he wished. Later, Dr. Swart of the Andrew Murray Reformed Church in Johannesburg wanted a copy to bring out a paperback edition in English for his new English-speaking congregation. One of the more memorable visits I had was to the university city of Stellenbosch, uh, where 7,000 students are said to worship in the various Reformed churches on Sunday, with 600 of these students teaching in Sunday schools and doing evangelistic work on Sunday. From the scholastic angle, Stellenbosch reminded me very much of Heidelberg in Germany, with its long tradition of scholarship. But only in this respect. When I visited Heidelberg a few years ago, I entered the ancient castle on the hill and saw some of the gigantic beer casks, one twenty-four by twenty feet there, eloquent testimony to the convivial habits of a city dedicated to knowledge. And this, though Heidelberg is said to be the place where the Reformation first broke out in the 16th century. Stellenbosch reminded me more of Calvin's Geneva uh, even than it reminded me of Heidelberg. For in Stellenbosch, as in Geneva, the pursuit of knowledge went hand in hand with a church and civic discipline which in 25 years made Geneva the, 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 the purest spot in Europe. I had lunch with the dean of the Reformed Seminary, 
in Stellenbosch, and I was then shown both the seminary and the dean's own church. Uh, Domini, or Reverend Van Wyck, related to the great Andrew Murray by blood, showed me over his church and spoke of the discipline of the Reformed Church in South Africa. From an earlier day, members of the church had been buried beneath the floor of the church so that an added holiness pervades the building each day of worship, as the worshippers today quite literally stand upon the graves of their forefathers. Also, nothing remotely approaching images is allowed in the architecture of the building, so that stained glass windows depicting human forms are disallowed. When Reverend Van Wyck told me of the discipline of the Reformed Church and how each minister must visit each church member, even though the membership runs over the thousand mark at least once every year, I was reminded of the Scottish Church in its sterner and greater days. Both ministers and elders must visit the church members in South Africa. Discipline of church members is actually carried out and a succession of visits, if necessary, is paid by the pastor and an accompanying elder to an erring member seeking to lead him to penitence and restoration. But perhaps the greatest feature of the Reformed Church life in South Africa is its annual Pentecostal meetings. These begin with Ascension Sunday and go on for the following ten days until the arrival of Whit Sunday. People are invited by their ministers to hear the infallible word of God before the scriptures are read on Sundays. Thousands of people throughout the land attend these Pentecostal meetings and hundreds declare for Christ. The message of Pentecost is proclaimed. The Holy Spirit is honored. Andrew Murray's well-known writings on the Holy Spirit are still the standard for many Reformed people in South Africa. The South African Reformed Church is opposed to the tongues movement, but it is not afraid to preach about the true Pentecostal blessing. This feature of Reformed Church life in South Africa each year should be publicized abroad. I doubt if anywhere in the world such a spiritual phenomena could be found. Here is a people the Africana nation, numbering just two million souls out of a total white population of three and a half million, dedicated to the belief in an infallible Bible of strongly Calvinistic leanings with widespread emphasis on discipline at both ministerial and lay levels, holding annual ten-day Pentecostal meetings where the results challenge the entire Reformed Church throughout the land. Such a church, with such an emphasis and background in the context of South Africa's isolation from world opinion because of its peculiar racial problems, could become the spearhead for national revival through a revived church. South Africa could well become the key to African evangelistic expansion, and the Reformed Church of South Africa could well be the key to South African revival. If keen overseas evangelical ministers or laymen could make their way to Stellenbosch during these ten days of Pentecostal meetings, it could furnish them with inspiration and challenge them to go home and seek to reproduce in their own country what they had seen in South Africa. Participation through an interpreter or in English would inspire them further. Not only the inspirational side of the Reformed Church's activities, but its missionary outreach and its theological and university training is of first-rate importance. Very large sums of money are annually given to promote missionary work among the black Africans. The bias of theological training is very strongly conservative and very scholarly. Students are rooted and grounded in the infallible word of God. Ties with Holland are weakening 
and not as intimate as they once were. It would appear that South Africa is much more conservative on the whole than its Dutch motherland. One practical step which could spread the fire and the scholarly grasp of scripture of the South African Reformed Church would be the invitation of key men to lecture and to preach overseas. Dr. Willie Marais, for example, sometimes called the Billy Graham of South Africa, could well grace any convention platform anywhere in Australia. Likewise, Reverend Milan of Krugersdorp and Reverend Kraywagen of Leopard Slay. While Dr. Swart of Johannesburg, Dr. Vorster of Cape Town, Dr. Heldenhuis of Pretoria University Church, with the pastoral oversight of 2,000 students, and Professor Dr. de Tui, head of the Reformed Theological Seminary of Pretoria, could well lecture at any of our theological colleges. By having these men of sound evangelical conviction visit our shores, for example, it could stimulate us as evangelicals and encourage interchange of preachers between the two countries. Of course, not every country would look with sympathy on such a move because of South Africa's involved race problems. Indeed, the Reformed Church of America has a traditional attitude of hostility and opposition to South Africa in this regard. At the same time, visiting South African speakers could come not to air their government's policy, but to preach the gospel. While it is significant that everyone I have met who has actually spent some time in South Africa as a tourist has invariably become more sympathetic to that country's problems. But my interest is especially in the potential for revival which I found in South Africa. Here I must say, that South Africa shows more real potential than any other country I have ever visited. Its very isolation has tended to keep it protected to some extent from the inroads of liberalism, which always militates against scriptural revival because of its false view of scripture. Even the outworking in national affairs of the Reformed Church's attitude to scripture is an argument in favor of its adherence to scripture. The Reverend Dick Begby of the Evangelical Church of England in South Africa, Protestant, Reformed and Evangelical, uh, a retired colonel of the British Army who went to settle in South Africa, in a written statement declared that it was not the English speaking 40% but the Afrikaans speaking 60% of the white population of South Africa which held the serious view that righteousness alone exalted the nation and that it was the Afrikaans section of the nation those of the reformed persuasion who were the real hope of South Africa's future this statement from one who was a colonel in the British army before being ordained speaks volumes for the strength and moral stability of the Reformed Church of South Africa, which is the real backbone of the Afrikaans people. Unpalatable as it is for us who are English speaking to hear such things as this, plus the added fact that it is not the English speaking, but the Afrikaans students who are securing the top places in school examinations in South Africa, the blunt truth remains that a liberal theology produces a liberal discipline and a liberal discipline soon degenerates into a license which spurns laborious tasks and seeks the easy way out. I repeat, the future of South Africa as a nation is with the sober-minded 60% of the whites who are traditionally wedded to the belief that righteousness alone exalted the nation. The Afrikaners who embrace the conservative view of the book which preaches this austere yet salutary truth. I look to see revival in South Africa come from this Afrikaans speaking segment 
of the South African Church. I came back to Australia more convinced than ever that if we wish to see revival in our country, we must believe the Word of God and honor the Holy Ghost. Well, thus Dr. Whitney in his last South African visit. And now I, Francis Nigel Lee, born in Britain, raised and educated in South Africa, am about to relinquish my professorial work in the United States to go to the uttermost end of the earth to train Calvinistic preachers in the vast world continent of Australia. At a theological conference in Atlanta, Georgia, where we were both co-speakers back in 1976, Professor Dr. Richard Gaffin, uh, Professor of New Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, kindly referred to me as, quote, the prototype of the new international Calvinist of the future, unquote. I think Dr. Gaffin meant that I do try to combine the best of French, German, Swiss, Dutch, Scottish, American, and South African Calvinism in my own personal doctrine practice. It's indeed true. I have been much helped, especially by the Frenchman Calvin, by the Germans Olivianus and Ursinus, by the Dutchmen Kuyper and Doyeweert and Van Ruler, and by the Americans Edwards and Van Til and Rush Dooney, by the South Africans Potgitter and Stoker and Center. In conclusion, then, I would like to suggest a program for Calvinistic takeover of the whole world uh, by a fusion of Calvinian predestinarianism and of Kuyperian cultural philosophy uh, and of Vantillian Trinitarianism and of Stokerian structuralism and of Edwardsi Edwardsian eschatology and of Rushdoonian reconstructionism uh, in my own style, more or less as follows. I believe that first and foremost we need to study the Bible before developing a doctrine of science. And I think that we need to start with the triune God, the real former of culture, pointing to God's aseitas or independence, but to recognize he is not a deus otiosis or a lazy God. He is the transcendent creator, yet the imminent maintainer. He is the creator who began everything and who culturally forms everything. The Father, the creator and maintainer of all nature, the raw material of man's culture. The Son, the recreator and maintainer of all nature and human culture. Proverbs 8, Psalm 19 and 33. The Holy Spirit, the completer and ruler of all nature and culture. Psalm 33, Psalm 104, Psalm 33, etc. In short, the triune God, the author of all things, the Father, the giver of every good gift, the Son, the mediator, the Logos, and the consummator spirit of both nature and culture, the one who created the world in order to make it, to make it through man, through the actions of man as the image of this triune God. I believe we then need to move on from the triune God to the unfallen Adam as his image. Adam was God's image in every respect, spiritually, materially, culturally, in holiness or wholesomeness, knowledge and righteousness or law-keeping. He was a law-abiding person in respect of the cosmic implications of all Ten Commandments. The covenant of works was established with him. The cultural mandate was enjoined to him. This was imperative and comprehensive. He is the dresser and the keeper, the developer and protector of all things, of the gold and the onyx stone, uh, the protagonist of mining and adorning, 
the name giver to the animals and to his wife, the one who cared, the one who developed science and poetry, the one who needed to multiply in order to be able to make the earth further through his descendants, the one entitled to ultimate cultural reward, eternal life and eternal Sabbath after his cultural labors in this life in entering into the consummation. I believe we next need to understand the teaching of the Bible regarding the second Adam, Jesus Christ. His coming was already predicted in the Protevangelium, which said that the seed of the woman, our Savior, would crush the serpent's head. This has cultural implications. Christ is the divine Logos and the human Logos. He enlightened the Canaanites. Calvin tells us in his commentary on John 1 and John 8 and in his Institutes, Book 2, and in his commentary on Genesis 4, that Jabal Jubal Tubalkine, the Canaanites, could only achieve what they did through the work of Christ and his Spirit in enlightening them without regenerating them. Christ it is who is the ark of the nature culture covenant. The Old Testament theophanies and the wisdom literature all point to him. His earthly mission itself had cultural implications. His heavenly session after his ascension into heaven has further cultural implications. And at the time of his second coming or parousia from heaven, he will return to bring about the apocatastasis tone tantone, the resurrection and the consummation of all things. Next, I believe, we need to understand the teaching of Scripture relating to the Holy Spirit as the engineer of man's cultural development. He is the life spirit given to the unfallen Adam, one of the us in Genesis 1.26. He is the Ruach Hayom, the spirit of the day in Genesis 3. The spirit that developed whatever was valuable in Canaanite culture, according to John Calvin. He is the spirit that strove with man before the flood. The spirit of understanding, the spirit of art, Exodus 31. The regenerative and task-enabling spirit, Exodus 37, uh, Ezekiel 37. He is the poured-out cosmic spirit of wind and fire, and reign of Acts chapter 2. He is the comprehensive fruitful spirit of Genesis of Galatians 5. He is the gift-giving spirit of 1 Corinthians 12. In short, he is the cosmic, the all-embracing, the heavenly spirit of recreation. Yes, he is the spirit of culture. Next, I believe we need to understand the teaching of God's word as it relates to the lost sinner, totally depraved, yet still cultural. Cain, the city builder, Jabel, the cattle raiser and the architect, Jubal, the musician, Tubalkine, the metallurgist, Nimrod, the hunter, the imperialist, the tower builder, Tirah, the idol manufacturer, Esau, the hunter, Pharaoh, the treasure city constructor, the golden calf, the Philistines, metal workers, Hiram Abbott, the architect, Sennacherib, the soldier, Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor, the great cultural nations of Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Tyre, Sidon, Greece, and Rome, all need to be studied in the Bible. Book of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Nahum, Luke, Acts, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Titus, and especially the book of Revelation. Important heathen persons such as Cyrus uh, need to be studied. Also the technique of idol manufacturing. Antichrist himself, the false church, and also a reflection as to whether there will be any culture in hell or not. And then I believe we need to take a look at what Scripture says about regenerate man as the renewed homo colens, 
man the cultivator. Adam was an agriculturalist before and after the fall. Eve was the mother of all living and the name giver of her children. Seth and Enosh uh, were involved in cultic worship, that is, worship using man-developed cultural forms. Noah, the shipbuilder, the nature preserver, the wine farmer. Genesis 9, the renewal of the cultural mandate and the expansion of of political governments as a high and a holy and a godly task. Job and Elihu, the philosophers, Jacob the geneticist and the cattle breeder, Joseph the statesman and the economist, Moses the national leader and the writer and the lawgiver, Aaron the diplomat, Miriam the poetess, Bezaliel and Oholiah uh, the artists, Joshua the soldier statesman, Caleb the spy, the judges, politicians, Hannah the poetess, David the poet, the soldier, the statesman, Solomon the philosopher, king, temple builder, and poet, Etham, Heman, and children of Korah being singers, Joash, Hezekiah, and Josiah, rulers and cultural reformers, Amos the farmer, Daniel the statesman, Esther the queen, Ezra the lawyer, Nehemiah the governor, Jesus the carpenter, Luke the physician, Paul the scholar and the tent maker, Zenos the lawyer, and the instruction of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Christian slaves, Christian freemen, Christian married people, and Christian bachelors and spinsters, and widows and widowers, all of them regenerate, whether they ate or whether they drank or whatever they did. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, were and are to do all things to the glory of God. And next, I believe, we need to understand the teaching of the Bible as regards future cultural development, its eschatological pattern and calling. First of all, deep sights in this world, here and now. The future subjugation, the ongoing um, extension of man's godly man's control over the entire earth to God's glory 1 Corinthians 15 Ephesians 1 Colossians 1 Matthew 28 19 all linked up with Genesis 1 verses 26 through 28 the cultural achievements of the lust are to be exploited and expanded and differently applied by us the saved for example Noah inherits antidiluvian achievements. Melchizedek uses those of the king of Sodom. Jacob annexes Laban's herds. Joseph and Moses utilize the treasures of Egypt. Joshua occupies the land of Canaan. Solomon uses the cedars of Lebanon for the temple, etc. Isaiah 27, 28, 54, 60, Daniel 2, Daniel 12, Amos 9, Acts 15, Micah 4, Revelation 17 and 18. Moreover, the elect are called upon by Almighty God to do precisely this. Isaiah 11, 35, 40, 52, 62, Ezekiel 36 and 37, Ezekiel 40 through 48, Matthew 5, verse 5, James 3, Revelation 3, verse 18, etc., all nations are thus predestined to become cosmically cultural Christian peoples in this life before the second coming. Psalm 72, 8 to 7, 96 through 98, Isaiah 2, 11, 49, 65, 66, Haggai 2, Zechariah 2 and 9, Malachi 1 verse 11 and four verses two through three, etc. But when we leave this life and go to heaven, this Christ-honoring culture is expanded, gain sights on the other side of the grave, for there will be cultural singing, Revelation 4 through 7, chapter 7, 14, 15, and 19. There will be cultural worship, Revelation 4, 5, 6, and 15. There will be cultural adornment, Revelation 6 
and 19, reigning, Revelation 20, and at the parousia of Jesus Christ, involving a judgment over all of the world's cultures, Isaiah 24, Revelation 18, and 1 Peter 3, the new earth will be inaugurated forever, the eschatological fusion of the heavenly life and the new earthly life as a consummation of the this earthly life to the glory of God to last forever and ever, where there will be cultural joy, service, and rulership. Romans 8, 2 Peter 3, Revelation 2 and 3, Hebrews 11 and 12, and where there will be cosmos embracing human law keeping unto all eternity. Revelation 21, 22 verses 14 and 15, all of it from, through, and unto the triune God. Well now, so much for the general biblical outline that I think needs to govern us. We also need a strategy as we move forward toward this goal. And I think the strategy needs to center around two main poles. First, subduing the entire earth to God's glory in all that we do. Second, discipling all of the nations and declaring to them all the counsel of God, teaching them to subdue the entire earth to God's glory in all that they do, as well as teaching them to communicate the gospel to every man. I believe in doing this we need to move from the common sense level just outlined to the theoretical level. We need to study each science. Uh, we need to start with a study of mathematics through geology under the inorganic sciences and then to proceed down through the other natural sciences to the cultural sciences and then to the philosophical sciences and lastly to the theological sciences. In each science as we deal with it, we need to explain first its practical importance, then to give a historical account of the development of that science, and last, chiefly on the basis of empirical research, we need to indicate the theoretical structure of each science, that is, the triune nature of the practical, historical, and doctrinal approach to each theoretic to each science. Now I'm not saying that all sciences always develop in this order from the practical through the historical to the theoretical. Indeed, genial theoretical formulations have sometimes stimulated historical research which has resulted in firm discoveries of much practical importance. But I am saying that the biblical and the logical way to study any science is to proceed from the practical through the historical to the theoretical. Genesis 1 verses 1 through 28, Genesis 2 verses 19 through 20, Genesis 4 verses 16 through 22, etc. And I think we need to do this starting first with numbers and space and movement as the terrain investigated by mathematics then with man and mathematics as the one who investigates that terrain and the manner in which it is investigated and to apply this approach to all of the sciences as we move up from mathematics through theology. In point of fact, we need to start with the eternal triune God above the time barrier in eternity. And then under him we need to see creation in time and with time creation embracing everything that has been made, creation lasting as long linearly as does the world itself. We need to see that God created man in his image, in time, and gave his great dominion charter to man. Subdue the earth and the sea and the sky. Subdue the earth, meaning epistemologically, realize at the common sense experiential level. Genesis 2, verse 15. Analyze at the specialized scientific uh, knowledge level. Genesis 2, verses 19 through 20. And finally, synthesize, bring it all together at the general scientific 
uh, knowledge level. In analyzing in the sciences, we have what I shall call the analytical sciences, man's systematization of God's total revelations in scripture and in nature about functions and things governed by the inorganic sciences such as mathematics, surveying, mechanics, engineering, astronomy, physics, chemistry, and geology, etc. For God has told man to be Lord over the earth. Second, we need to analyze the animals and the plants in the organic sciences, microbiology, bacteriology, botany, agriculture, zoology, animal husbandry, veterinary science, animal psychology, etc. For man is also to be Lord over the plants and the animals. Third, man is to systematize the humanitarian sciences, medicine, human psychology, logic, history, linguistics, sociology, economics, aesthetics, music and art, law and politics and ethics, for man is the co-image of God. And last, man is to analyze the theological sciences, which are sciences sui generis, bibliology, ecclesiology, dogmatology, diaconology, missiology, and all of their sub-branches, for man is the image of God, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, Genesis 1, verses 27 through 28. So then, all of these natural sciences dealing with man's relationship to the inorganic and the organic subhuman creatures. Man's endeavors in the cultural sciences dealing with man himself. And man's undertaking of the theological sciences dealing with his relation to God form yet one more uh, trinity reflecting the ontological trinity. And after this analysis has been undertaken, we reach the third stage, that of synthesis. Uh, realize, analyze, and synthesize, and which we reassemble under ins inspiration and guidance of the Holy Spirit, man's general scientific knowledge in the realm of philosophy, the science of the sciences of creation, in its tension with theology, the science of the Creator, to the extent to which it has pleased him to reveal himself to man. All of this then becomes an educational instrument at the disposal of godly man in promoting the coming of the kingdom down through the future centuries to be kept forever on the new earth for all time. Now when we promote God's kingdom in this way at the common sense level and at the scientific level, through culture and through evangelism, we need to see that we are disobedient Christians if we have not been trying to subdue the whole earth, the whole sea, and the whole sky in our businesses, in our home life, and in our national society, exclusively to the glory of the triune God. We are disobedient Christians if we have not been involved in attempting to Christianize all nations everywhere including the Russians and the Red Chinese and the North Vietnamese just as much as the American Indians and the Mexican Americans and the American Jews. We are disobedient Christians if we have just been sitting on the fence waiting for the second coming of Christ. For God has clearly revealed that he would have us to subdue the, the earth and to convert the nations rather than to sit and to speculate about the times and the seasons of the second coming. Let us then admit that we have been disobedient Christians, but let us right now also resolve to obey God in the future, for Christ's sake. And we have the power to do this, the power of the indwelling, omnipotent Spirit of God. At Pentecost, the Church received that power when the Holy Ghost came down, power to be Christ's witnesses in all that we think and do, both here at home and even unto the uttermost parts of the earth. There's much idolatry to be overcome as we do this. The idolatry at Ephesus, for example, was great, but it was overcome by the Christians 
uncompromising worship of the risen Christ alone, the Ephesian churches, uh, the Ephesian Christians knew that the temples of Diana would ultimately crumble under the spiritual battering ram of the Christian church. Matthew 16, verse 18. The Christians knew that this would happen as the little flock of Jesus slowly expanded into the spirit-empowered army of the living God and his holy and impregnable fortress. Widespread public pilfering would gradually cease in Ephesus as the Roman Empire became more and more Christianized and, later still, as the Puritan work ethic began to dominate early Protestant society in Switzerland, Holland, Scotland, the United States, and South Africa. Christians today must be able to ward off the attacks of the devil and his agents. They must actually take the offensive. They are commanded to wield the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with a society no longer optimistic as to its ultimate success, humanist society, but more and more torn apart by doubt and despair. Today is perhaps the most favorable time of all since the French Revolution itself for us to launch a Christian counterattack worldwide and to regain control of Western culture and to reprogram the direction of future history Christward. At present, between Christ's ascension and his second coming, the living Savior is expanding his human dominion. We Christians are called by God to proclaim an anti-nihilistic cultural optimism. We are to attempt nothing less than the reduction of every facet of the culture of the whole world to the recognition of the all-embracing Lordship of Jesus Christ. This is the implication of both the Dominion Charter and the Great Commission as Calvin himself so clearly taught. This will involve, of course, the evangelization of the, whole <coughs> of the whole world and our own personal engagement in this, and together with this, it will also involve our working for the recognition of the Ten Commandments as the supreme standard, not only in the private lives of Christians, but also in the public affairs of all nations, including the United States, the Soviet Union, and Red China. The gospel of Jesus goes forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer. The Christians overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The ever everlasting gospel is preached to every nation and kindred and tongue and people that dwells on the earth until all nations shall come and worship before thee. Let us then evangelize all that we can, condemning sin and upholding God's commandments, preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, preaching indiscriminately to friends and foreigners, commoners and kings, preaching to the entire man in terms of the dominion charter and man's daily work, testifying uncompromisingly in public and in private, patiently and enthusiastically enjoining all our dedication to the total kingship of Christ and confidently laboring in the knowledge that the Savior, uh, the risen Savior, through his power flowing from his heavenly throne into his spirit-filled church here on earth shall overcome all opposition and by the church's powerful gospel preaching and consistent living shall yet reduce Christ's enemies to a footstool under his feet. The doomed theologians have pessimistically made a major contribution to the state of defeatism of many of the present day people of God. These theologians have regarded the Antichrist as a powerful end time personal potentate and one world dictator who either all but destroys the Church of Christ or who alternatively enslaves all of the people of the world. But such, I believe, is not the teaching of the infallible Word of God. Indeed, the many whomsoever texts of the Bible themselves tend to militate against this position. 
There is no scriptural warrant in assuming that the lost will always numerically predominate over the saved, for the word of God itself clearly prophesies that this very earth of ours shall yet become full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God did not create his word, His earth in vain. He formed it to be inhabited, to be subdued, to be Christianized, and to be filled with the knowledge of his glory. This teaching of scripture then is the ultimate ground of our confidence. For we are to pray each day as enjoined by the Lord Jesus himself, Thy kingdom come, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Twenty-five lectures ago, we commenced looking at the faith of the fathers. We started with Adam and the Old Testament. Then we went through the Apocrypha and the New Testament. Next, we surveyed the early church patristics down through the Protestant Reformation. And finally, we traced the development of subsequent Calvinism through Holland down to South Africa today. Professor Portgitter told me to go to America 15 years ago, pointing out that uh, many of these cultural treasures that, uh, by God's grace, we have imbibed are concealed to many of the English-speaking people in the world. Well, humbly, I would now propose to export this faith of the fathers from Adam's thought through Africana thought, to export it to America and even to Australia and the uttermost parts of the earth. As Tosius wrote, I am the white child of South Africa, trekking further on into America and from here further into Australia. Trek on! How far? As far as God would have us trek. So then, I believe that the words of the last verse of uh, the South African National Anthem uh, composed by the great Calvinists M.L. de Villiers and C.J. Langenhoven are adequate and correct at this point. Let South African Calvinists and American Calvinists export to Australia and everywhere else what they have to offer. Let each nation borrow from the other and give to the other in return, and let us together as those that love God go forward as one body undertaking the conquest of the earth. The anthem, Obi Almach fast vertrouwend, et ons vader de gebou, skenk ook ons die kracht u Heere, om te handhaaf en te hou, dat die erwe van ons vaders vir ons kinders erwe bly, knechte van die allerhoogste, Teen die hele wereld vry. Soos ons vader vertrouw het, leer ook ons vertrouw o Heer, met ons land en met ons nasie, sal dit wel wees God regeer. Let me attempt an approximate translation into English in closing. And may these words be an inspiration to Calvinists everywhere, so that God's true people may triumph from sea to sea, and from the rivers of Ethiopia, even to the very ends of the earth. In Jehovah God Almighty, did our fathers safely trust. Give us too, O Lord, the power to keep building firm and just. May the treasures of our fathers for our children treasures be. We are slaves of God Almighty in the world, and so we're free. As our ancestors have trusted, Lord, teach us to trust thee still, for then thou wilt rule our nation, and we'll gladly do thy will.